Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much that your word doesn't change. That through the centuries and through the millennium, your word has stayed the same. Because it's been settled in heaven, it's established firmly, cannot be shaken. I thank you that you have already set history in order. And you have made promises right from the very beginning of creation of that which you would accomplish to redeem mankind and to restore a fallen creation. And we are on the cusp of that coming to pass. Lord, it's not on the horizon anymore, but it's about to unfold before our very eyes. And we are so grateful that we're living at this period of time. May our lives be lived in such a way that we would be close to You, that we would pursue You, that we would follow hard after You. To do Your will. For your name's sake. And we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to take our Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to look at the Antichrist tonight in 1 Samuel chapter 8. I don't know if you've. uh, come to this passage before to look at God's plan for end times. But here it is. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing uh, displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Church, this is the word of God. You can go ahead and take a seat if you like. I see here a template, if you will, of what's going to be taking place as the end of days events unfold. Coming with the rapture and the tribulation, the return of Christ, and His rule and reign, and then, of course, the eternal kingdom. It had been God's intention all along to give Israel a king. But it would be according to His timing and His plan. However, the people had requested a king. Now, there's nothing wrong with requesting a king. But the reason they wanted a king wasn't so that God would be glorified, but so that they could be like all the nations around them. They wanted a king not only to be like the other nations, but because they were tired of God ruling over them. And they figured that by asking for a king, that they would then come under a different rule and authority. But that turned out not to be the case. And we see what ends up taking place is that 
Saul is selected. And he's a man described in the next chapter as a man who is head and shoulders above everyone else. And so he had a kingly stature. He was uh, he looked the part, but he didn't have a heart after God. So God gave them a king according to their own desires that reflected themselves. He says, Obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. And so he does so concerning Saul and successive kings. And Saul, we see, was a man who did not follow after the ways of God. We're told that because Saul had rejected the Lord, the the Lord rejected him. He refused to do what God had commanded him to do. So he figured his own ways were better than God's ways and made excuses for it at every turn. So on at least two occasions, there were encounters with Samuel, the prophet of God, where the Lord spoke to Saul and said, I have taken the kingdom out of your hands. And I'm giving it to another. And the other that he's going to give it to is a man who is after his own heart. And of course, that king was David. So we see a template here of a king after the desires of man's own hearts and his own purposes and his ends and the king after God's own heart. And we know as the Scriptures unfold from this point forward that David serves as a type of Christ. Even to the point that when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary in Luke chapter two or Luke chapter one, he said that you shall the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and you will conceive and bear a son. And he will sit on the throne of his father David. Now that's an important thing for us to recognize because it's not just a quaint Christmas time story. This is a promise that had been put into place in 2 Samuel chapter 7 when God had made a covenant with David that there would not cease to be one of his descendants upon the throne. That means that although it will appear as though the dynasty, David's dynasty, will die out, and that's what it appears today. Is there a king sitting on the throne in Jerusalem today? No. And there hasn't been one now for... Uh, 2,500 years. That's a long time for there to be no king. However, that doesn't mean that the kingdom has come to an end. Not when you're dealing with God, or rather, not when God is dealing with things. And so, Jesus, what tribe is He from? The tribe of Judah. And He's a descendant directly of David. And as such, he has rights to the throne. And so, with that being the case, we know that from Revelation chapter 19, among others, 16 as well, and we see it throughout the book of Revelation and other places throughout the Scriptures, that Jesus is going to return to earth. He'll be riding a white horse with many crowns upon his head. On his thigh is going to be written what? King of kings and Lord of lords, and out of his mouth comes a sharp double-edged sword with which to slay the nations. And this is being led by none other than the Antichrist. The one who would attempt to replace Christ. The one who is the epitome of all that is evil in a man. A man who is animated, excuse me, personified by Satan himself. And so we see a picture here through what's going on with Saul that this man is is put into place 
at the request of the people. And there is a movement afoot even today where the world is calling out for a leader to lead them. Globalism is on the rise. Looking for uh, borders to be torn down, and we've seen that taking place throughout Europe in what is known as the European Union. You can travel freely from country to country because there is essentially no borders. We see in the United States where there's a call for global participation and uh, supporting of global issues and ventures. But God didn't design or intend from Genesis 11 onwards for the world to be a global village. Not until the Prince of Peace comes to rule. Because the world is looking for globalization for what purpose? Peace and security. And that's what the Antichrist is going to do when he comes. He's going to present himself with a platform that he is going to offer peace and security. But that can't happen without the Prince of Peace, without Jesus Christ. You remember what the angel said? The night Jesus was born, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Does it end there? Upon whom His favor rests. See, the peace of God is not just a matter of peace because you, you would like to have peace. Peace is the result of, of God's favor being upon His people. I want to go ahead to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And when it talks about lawlessness, when Paul speaks about lawlessness, he doesn't speak... Uh, in regards to empty of law, he's speaking about a redefining of morality, of the law of God. That's what he's speaking about here. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus, you hear this? Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And Paul admonishes us that we would stand firm in the truth, that we would recognize that God is in control. Now, I want to show you this fact that God is in control. The, the man that, who's going to 
present himself as king, this world ruler, the Antichrist, we looked at some elements of that over the past couple of weeks when we looked at the one world uh, government and the one world religion. And tonight we're just having a glimpse at this one who will be at the helm of leading this movement. So he's a man of lawlessness. In other words, he's going to redefine things according to his own definition. And it's a sat satanic de definition, all right? Now I want us to go to Revelation chapter 6. Now, I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering, and to conquer. Now, this is the beginning of judgments upon those who dwell upon the face of the earth. Some have supposed that this rider of the white horse is Jesus. This is the Antichrist. See, Jesus doesn't come riding on a white horse until He comes to set up His kingdom, to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords, which is at the end of of the tribulation. This is at the beginning of the tribulation. Furthermore, who is it who is opening the seals? It's Jesus Himself. It's the Lamb. And so these seals and bowls and trumpets, these judgments that are being unleashed upon the earth are the judgments of the One who is laying claim to that which already belongs or rightfully belongs to Him, and that is the earth. Praise God that Satan just isn't... Uh, he, he's not an equal to God, an equal opposite to God. But he would have us believe that, wouldn't he? He would have the world believe that Satan, the powers of darkness, are equal opposites to God and the powers of light. And we see that in the world with different philosophies and different religious beliefs. The dark side and the light side and, and the, uh, the yin and the yang. The yin and the yang, excuse me. Things like this where, where they need to be kept in balance. But church, this is not a contest of good versus evil. Satan is not coming to power because he's finally determined I'm going to have my day and so I finally fought my way through so that I can do what I want to do. Uh-uh. This is, as you notice, now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! All right, it's time for you to come on to the stage of planet Earth. And the Antichrist is now given his place for a period of seven years. It's incredible to recognize that this is at the decree of the Lord. The Lord God Almighty. See, God did not wind up the world and the universe in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and then stop the winding, let it go, sit back, cross his arms, sit back in a lazy boy and watch what would unfold. He's intricately and intimately involved in every detail that takes place throughout the ages since the creation. And he has already decreed the end from the beginning. Yes! So what is about to take place is not circumstantial. It's not just by chance. It's by the decree of God. And so when 
Satan animates this world leader. It's not because Satan all of a sudden decides, okay, I'm going to do this. It's because the Lord has decreed this is going to happen. Now is the time and you are the one. See, Satan is a tool in the hands of God to bring about his own glory. We need to understand this. That Satan doesn't operate free will. Everything that he does is, is at the permission of God. I'll give you one example in Job chapter 1. What do we see what Job does not know or understand or, or is aware of? That Satan appears to God. After roaming throughout the earth. And the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, well, yeah, but he only serves you because you, you guard him, you protect him, you prosper him, you give him good, good things. So take your hand off of, off of his goods and so on, and he'll curse you. And the Lord said, it's not so. He said, well, let's put it to the test. And the Lord said to him, you may take away his possessions, you can take away his things, but you cannot touch the man. So he does, he he takes and there's a storm and the wind that blows down his house and kills his kids and there's raiders that come and steal his flocks and his camels and so on, his herds. He's left with no possessions. And what does Job do? He praises God. And then Satan came back and says, well, listen, it's because you protect his body. If you take your hand off of his body, sickness comes upon him, he'll curse you. He says, you may touch his body, but you cannot take his life. So he does so, and boils are all over his body. He's in agony and pain and writhing and so on, scraping the, the boils with the pot shirt. <laughs> but he doesn't curse God. He's confused. He doesn't understand all of this, but he doesn't curse God. And in the end, God vindicates Job, doesn't he? Even to the point that Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives and at the last day I will see Him. But do you notice that Satan, he can only do what God allowed him to do. That much and no more. This is what we see taking place. That this Antichrist, animated by Satan and the false prophet that will be working alongside of him to, to give proof, as it were, of his authority can only do so much for so long. And the time is going to come to an end. God is in control. There's nothing left to happenstance. I'd like us to go back to um, Revelation 6 here. I want to see something. There was a rider on a white horse. He had a bow and a crown that was given to him. He came out conquering and to conquer. Now, he's on a white horse. Why a white horse if Jesus at the end of the tribulation is going to become riding on a white horse? Because he is a counterfeit. He is the one who tries to present himself, Paul tells us, as an angel of light. He, that's how he masquerades. So that he can deceive the nations. Present himself as one who can be trusted. And he's looking to come to uh, minimize and to take away from the true and the living Christ. The true and the living God. Notice what's on his head. There's a crown. In Revelation chapter 19, we see that Jesus comes riding on the white horse, on a white horse, not the same one. And on his head is what? Many crowns. So do many crowns make uh, Jesus more powerful than this one crown of the Antichrist? No. But I want us to be aware that there's different types of crowns. The crown that uh, the Antichrist is wearing is the Stephanos. 
and it's a crown of victory. But it's a temporary victory. And the crowns that Jesus is wearing are called diadem. They're crowns of a sovereign. So if you picture an emperor, he wore a diadem. Competitors in Olympic Games, when they won, they wore a Stephanos. You see the difference? And this rider has a bow. And, and he's coming out conquering and to conquer. But notice he's given a bow, but what is missing in the description? Arrows. If you're an archer, you want not only a bow, but also arrows. Otherwise, it would seem as though your armament is incomplete and ineffective. But he's riding, carrying a bow with a, an image of power and authority to conquer, but not by virtue of, of bloodshed. He's going to conquer by intrigue. I want us to go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I want to begin looking here in verse 23. Now this is speaking of the Antichrist that will rise to power. Let's look at verse 22. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, <clears throat> excuse me, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. See, his power shall be great, but not by his own power, because the power he receives is from Satan. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. And by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Remember what we read in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 where he said that he will put himself as God, attempt to present himself as God himself. And so he is he's going to rule with deceit. He, he comes with cunning in order to deceive people. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24 to his disciples concerning the end of the age? Be on your guard that no one deceives you. See, that's one of the, the greatest things we need to be on our guard against in this day and age is that we don't get caught up in deception, in lies. We need to know the Word of God. We need to turn to the Word of God. And then here's what we see. So it's like he's, he's setting up his, his rule and reign. He's, he's going to have this bow as a conqueror, but he's not going to conquer by... Uh, wars and battles. He's going to conquer by cunning. And he's going to deceive the people. And he's going to present himself as a prince of peace. And that's why the nations are going to love him. That's why we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, be careful when they say, when everyone says, peace and security. Peace and security. Or peace and safety. If we took the time, we could investigate numerous uh, news clips, video clips of world leaders over the past handful of years where over and over again they are saying, we're doing this to bring about peace and safety. We're doing this to bring about peace and safety. Peace and security are our greatest measures, our greatest purpose, our greatest um, motives over and over again, but it's all speaking about globalism. Now look what he says. So without warning, excuse me, um, and in his own mind he will become great. So we saw that, that he's going to present himself as God. Without warning, he will destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken. 
but by no human hand. Because it's by the breath of the Lord's mouth that He's going to be destroyed. Isn't that incredible? I want you to realize that uh, this has been in the works for the last 60 years or so, 70 years. Well, of course, it's been in work longer than that, but we're seeing things. The stage is being set from the time that, that Israel became a nation. The United Nations had its formid, formative um, planning years before it became an entity in 1945 and onward. And one of the architects of the European Union, his name is Paul Henri Spake. I want to read something to you. I want to, I want to tell you some of his credentials. First of all, he was the Prime Minister of Belgium. Oh, excuse me, Belgium. He was the Belgian Prime Minister. One of the founding fathers of the United Nations. He was the second Secretary General of NATO. He was president of the United Nations General Assembly, and that was from 46 to 1947. He was the Secretary General of NATO from 1957 to 1961. And in 1957, he was part of the Treaty of Rome, which established the European Economic Community. Anybody know what that is? That was the precursor to the United Nations. So he was one of the founding fathers of the European Union. What is being set up as the birthplace, if you will, the launch place for the Antichrist. Here's what he is quoted as saying. We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the alliances of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. That's the spirit of this age. It's asking for a king that will rule according to their own hearts but they're going to get far more than they ever bar bargained for. Just like the people got far more, and when I say far more, I mean far worse than what they had bargained for. But God is going to give what is best in the person of Jesus Christ. He gave David as a type, a man after his own heart. But he's going to give, after this man rules for seven years, he's going to give the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, the Almighty, the Prince of Peace. <laughs> Praise be to his name. I want us to go back to Isaiah chapter 9 for a moment. Isaiah chapter 9. I want to look at verses 6 and 7. It's a passage of Scripture that you're familiar with. And again, particularly around Christmas time. But it's not a Christmas passage. This was a passage that far preceded, predated the arrival of Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem. This was 700 years earlier. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now the world is looking for a global peace. And they're looking for a world without borders. But God, since uh, Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, has not intended for the world to be without a, a world without borders, but instead nations with borders, because nations with borders serve to police other nation states, don't they? When they start going AWOL or evil, the other nation states tend to keep them in check. 
But when borders are knocked down and the world becomes one global environment or one global community, there's, there's no checks or balances. And there's only one that's going to be seen to be ruling and reigning, and that will be this man that we know as the Antichrist. As of yet, not named and unknown, unpresented to the world. See, peace can only happen when Jesus Christ brings peace. And here's what we read in verse 7. Of the increase of His government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over His kingdom. Why? Because He's going to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And how is it going to be accomplished? The zeal of the Lord of hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth will do this. See, here's the mindset of the world. Anybody uh, former, we, anybody used to be Beatles fans? I don't mean the little animals, but I mean the little insects. But the, uh, the, the craze from the United Kingdom. Any Be Beatles followers still? <laughs> uh, Anybody recognize or aware of the song that the Beatles made great named Imagine? Recognize the title, Imagine? I'm going to read the words for you and see if you can hear. This is the, uh, th this is the theme song, if you will, of the one world government. Now, it doesn't mean the one world government has come out and said, this is our theme song, <laughs> but, okay? But in a sense, this is the theme song of the one world government and of the Antichrist. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Why would you want to do that? Because you don't want to acknowledge sin or consequence thereof. So, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. You recognize that part of the song? Except it's in falsetto, and I can't do falsetto. Imagine there's no countries, no borders. It isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. But there'll be a one world religion. We looked at that last week. Imagine all the people living in peace. Church, what is the peace, the universal peace symbol? It's according to the world. It's a line straight down and then coming from its lower third to uh, cross pieces like this in a circle. It's an upside down broken cross. How do you get peace from an inverted broken cross? Can't happen. It can only come through the cross. You may say I'm a dreamer. But I'm not the only one. I hope somehow you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. A brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may think or say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. No, that's only that's not going to be by us bringing it to pass. And church, I want to I want to with as we close with this, I want us to be aware that this is infiltrated into the church so that there are huge sections of what is referred to as the church today who believe that they can usher in the kingdom of God by our own efforts and and by bringing about good and peace and harmony and eliminating hunger and, and so on and so forth. It's called dominion theology. And it's prevalent upon, among the health and wealth propagators. But it's not going to come to pass until Jesus Christ comes to rule and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And you will find that those who, who present and promote those kinds of false teachings will also reject 
a time of tribulation. They'll reject the rapture of the church and they'll, they'll reject a, an antichrist. They'll reject all of these things and say these are, are uh, allegory, that they're not true, they're not prophecy, they're not future events. And if anything, if, if there's any reality to them at all, then they're past history. This word is a sure word. And Paul, uh, excuse me, John begins this letter, this book, by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And church, that's what we're looking to do, is to keep the words of this prophecy, because the time is near. The time is short. And the world is being deceived Paul told us in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the Lord is going to send a delusion that the people are going to believe a lie. Can I close with this? Yesterday, Deb and I were doing some yard work. Putting down a new gravel path. and It's a lot of work to putting down a gravel path. And when you do that, you sort of think, well, I'm investing into my home and And I want to beautify the place where I live and keep it looking nice and make it last long and make it usable and 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 make it uh, welcoming. And then Deb said this. You think anyone will live here? Anyone will want to just squat and take our house when we are raptured? I said, yeah, probably so. Then she made an interesting comment to me that has it's one of those things that gets lodged a good way. We should write a letter for whoever might come into this house if that were to take place. Because this is real. It's not a fable. It's not some cleverly invented story. It's not science fiction. It's not the latest blockbuster to come from Hollywood. This is the very Word of God. And for those that may live in our house or yours, once we're taken out of here, because they'll, for the most part, be perfectly good houses, and they won't stay vacant to those who are looking for shelter, It might be worth our while to consider writing a letter and leaving it alongside. It's going to be a letter of instruction and tell them to pick this up because the letter on its own serves no purpose unless they're directed to this, which will be their map to Jesus Christ.